Good evening. This is your host, Mark Greenstein, for this week's production of And Now You Are Aware. This week we have with us Mike Siegelman, amateur radio operator. In spite of his laryngitis, Mike is, we're very lucky to have him. Mike, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be on the show, and it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about amateur radio to, from the very beginning of how do you get this equipment? Well, I'm glad you asked about that. Uh, it's, it's a hobby. It's an electronic hobby. Uh, it is an opportunity to communicate with people all over the world. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, I got interested in amateur radio, or as some people call it ham radio, when I was in high school. Uh, it was an opportunity for me to, to communicate with people, not just in my local community, but my goodness, all over the world. And, and as a matter of fact, even today, uh, we had young people getting started in amateur radio as, long, as young as 10 and 11 years old. Uh, I got involved in it in high school with a group of uh, other people in a club and became licensed and uh, was eventually gained the license of call letters as were assigned by the Federal Communications Commission of K0BUD. Uh, amateur radio, however, has been around a lot longer than I've been around, Mark. It's been around uh, since the early 1920s. And a matter of fact, most of today's broadcast stations have actually uh, got their starts as shortwave stations or amateur radio stations. Uh, amateur radio began in the, uh, before broadcasting did uh, to communicate uh, using what we called in those days spark gap. A spark gap, you've seen a, you know how a spark plug mm -hmm. shoots a little gap? Well, that actually also creates a little uh, radio uh, frequency signal, you know, snap, you hear it on a radio. Well, they started communicating by those sparks they call it spark ga gap radio. And they started first communicating with that back in the 20s because they didn't have electron tubes in those days. Eventually, however, along with the advancement of electronics, electron tube, and other things, uh, they started developing into more reliable communications. And uh, International Morse Code was basically the language in those days. The dots and the dashes were sent all over America and all over the world. Let me ask you a question about the Morse Code. Is sure. the Morse Code had, do they have to study this, or how did they get this, did each letter stand for something, or how do you You're right. Uh, Morse code uh, was developed uh, by Samuel Morris, utilizing dots and dashes. For example, an A is a dit and a dot, or a dot and a dash. And we say dida, that's an A. And uh, an M, for your first letter of your name, Mark, would be da-da. And each letter and each number has a different sound a different uh, arrangement of dots and dashes. Uh, what we've actually done now is, uh, in amateur radio, as the years have gone, uh, gone, through, uh, gone by, uh, amateur radio has developed into all kinds of means of communications. Uh, some of the electronic wonders we have today, including, uh, including television, started with amateur radio, and then they're developed into com commercial purposes. In fact, some of the world's uh, best scientists were amateur radio operators to begin with. Uh, amateur radio grew by leaps and bounds, uh, a couple hundred thousand hams in the United States right before World War II. And then when World War II happened, amateur radio operators were asked to stay off the air to not give out any kind of information to the enemy. And so amateur radio was stopped in the United States. And immediately after the war, with the uh, soldiers returning, having learned a lot about shortwave radio and communications during the war, a lot of these people got into amateur radio. And after the war in 1945 and 1946, the uh, Federal Communications again started licensing amateur radio stations. And into the 50s, it grew by leaps and bounds. There were something like 350,000 amateur operators in the 50s. So the population grew, with the exception of during the war years, mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. And today, there are over 600,000 amateurs in the United States and roughly another 450 or 500,000 worldwide. So there's over a million amateur radio operators of <laughs> all ages and all walks of life. Explain how amateur radio was very popular during the Persian Gulf War. Uh, during the Persian Gulf War, people were calling amateur radio operators so they can talk to their sons or daughters in the Gulf. Sure. How did that play We may be getting role? a little ahead of the story, Mark, but uh, I'll certainly comment on that. Uh, uh, during the Gulf War, uh, there was a uh, organization that was created by a gentleman here in the Twin Cities by the name of Ed Addy. And Ed set up a, uh, with cooperation of the federal government, uh, set up a Nike missile base uh, down towards Farmington. 
a special amateur radio operation, but it did not ad operate on amateur frequencies, it operated on military frequencies. And we were given permission to use amateur operators to operate on these frequencies and communicate with amateur operators in the Gulf War area. Uh, we were able to supply uh, a signal into the Gulf and out of the Gulf on a rather regular basis in which we could uh, actually uh, provide uh, people living all over the country to call into our station. We would put them on the air and they would hear them in the Gulf so the soldiers were able to communicate with their loved ones back here in the States during the Gulf War. And that was quite a feat and uh, Ed got a lot of awards for that and it was indeed something that uh, I was very happy to be a part of. But getting back to what amateur radio is growing to, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit if I could, uh, amateur radio operators are licensed by the Federal Communications Commission. They must know the Morse code in order to get the more advanced licenses. They also must know a great deal of electronic theory, and they also must know, of course, all the Federal Communication rules and regulations. You could, don't have to ha know the code to get started, however. And we have what's now called the no-code class of license in which you can get a beginner's license mm -hmm. and talk on that on with, with, with a, a microphone uh, and talk locally, basically, with very low power. And that's kind of an introductory class of license. From there, after taking further exams and passing the International Morris Code at 13 words a minute, you can get what's called the general class license, and then you can get yourself involved with talking with amateurs from all over the world. How long does it take to go from the beginning to the international license? Well, it, I've known some people have done it in a month. I know some other people that have been in ham radio for 10, 15 years and have never upgraded. So it all depends on the individual. I guess it's just like how long does it take to go to college? Mm -hmm. It's up to you. And, uh, but most people take a couple of years before they get to the top license. Uh, maybe I should talk a little bit about some of the different modes of amateur radio today. Um, there's amateur television. Now, here we're on television right now, but uh, a lot of the things that we're using in the equipment in the studios here were designed by amateur radio operators. Uh, amateur television operates uh, uh, two, uh, in two different modes. One is called full scan TV, and we're watching fast scan right now, but full scan TV paints a picture on a tube very slowly, but that, can, that signal can be sent around the world. When they're using amateur radio uh, for this kind of television as we're using today with a picture of the quality that the audience is watching on this, uh, on this show, uh, that's called fast scan television. And fast scan TV is basically local. And there's amateurs right now here in the Twin Cities talking back and forth in front of their own little studios to each other using amateur television. Uh, there's also what we call single sideband, which is a form of phone communications, which we speak in a microphone and talk to amateurs all over the United States and all over the world. I communicate on a regular basis up until recently with a friend of mine, uh, 4Z4GM in Haifa, Israel. And it's no big deal to grab a microphone and talk to my friend Moise Ben Ezri in, in Haifa, Israel, or in England, or talk to somebody in South America, or in the Virgin Islands, or Hawaii. And as a matter of fact, a little bit, we're going to see a picture of a friend of mine, KE6AFQ from Hilo, Hawaii, and just uh, a little later in the show. We also uh, still use code. We're required to at least know it. We also use uh, some more uh, advanced forms of communications, uh, digital communications. Uh, amateurs develop a means of communicating using the computer. We call it packet. That has now become much more sophisticated and is involved with commercial transmission of digital communications uh, that you can now buy on a commercial basis. But this was developed by ham operators. We're also involved with satellite communications. We actually have amateur radio satellites circling the world and we talk through them. We send a signal up to the satellite, and the satellite retransmits the signal back to the Earth somewhere else, and we can talk to hams all over the world via amateur satellite. Is amateur radio all its own frequency, or does CB radios? CB know, has very little to do with amateur radio. CB operators are limited to five watts. Amateur radio operators can operate as much as 2,000 watts. Uh, amateur operators have their own bands, uh, very wide, expansive bands with room for a lot of people. CB is located in just a very narrow gap and has very, very no connection, really. Uh, a lot of CB operators develop into amateurs and drop the CB and go take their amateur tests. And that's, in fact, one of our best sources of amateurs today is coming from the CB bands. And you got to talk to somebody? Well, we'll get a chance to do that here. Uh, I have a good friend of mine who is located right here in the Twin Cities. We're going to be talking on FM. Uh, police use repeaters, uh, and so do truckers and, and ambulances. 
You send a signal out. It's received by another automatic amateur radio station, Mark, and sent out on a high antenna so it can be heard throughout the metropolitan area. But we also have amateur radio repeaters. And as a matter of fact, I have a friend of mine standing by right now on an amateur radio repeater. Let's see if we can find him. KB0CO, KB0CO, KB0BUD calling. Uh, good evening to you, Joe. Just thought we'd give a little demonstration of amateur radio tonight. Uh, we're located uh, in the studios of uh, uh, a very well-known cable system here in the Twin Cities, and uh, we wanted to say hi to you this evening. I have Mark here, and uh, Mark and I thought we'd just give you a call. Where are you located? Hi, Mark, and Mike, of course, I know you. I'm uh, in my car right now, just um, coming between uh, Minnetonka and Hopkins and uh, heading into St. Louis Park. Okay, Joe, excellent. How much power are you running there tonight? Five watts into an antenna that's uh, mounted onto the left rear fender of the car. Okay, fine. Five watts of power, and he's talking all over the Twin Cities. I would say you could be heard out about, what, 50, 60 miles, uh, Joe? KB0 for you, Mobile. Ron, could you stand by, please? Go ahead, Joe. And hi to you, Ron. Uh, 50 miles would be pretty comfortable distance, uh, even with the low power. Um, I'd my guess is that uh, with this car to car, it would be about maybe 12 to 15 miles through the use of the repeater station, then uh, out to 50 miles, uh, a radius of the Twin Cities. Excellent. Well, we're going to jump out of here, uh, Joe, and thank you very much for getting on this evening, uh, and I hope we can get a chance to chat with you a little later. Uh, Mark uh, says hello and oh. passes along his regards. KB0CO, we'll see you later tonight, uh, Joe K0, be you clear. Hey, Mike, and thanks. And, uh, Mark, sometimes in the summer we're out spotting tornadoes, believe it or not, through the Skywarn system. So, thanks for the call, Mike. k 0 B U D. Thank you. Mobile is now clear. Seven E-trees. So, he, so they do a little bit of weather watch, too, then? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the activities that amateur radio uh, gets into. But I have some things I'd like to show you first. Okay. Now, I talked to a very simple little, what we call a handheld. This looks like the kind of handheld that you would uh, perhaps see... Uh, a policeman wear, okay? The difference is there's a computer in here. This will operate not just on one band or set of frequencies, but many more frequencies than the police operate on, and it runs up to five watts of power, all right here in one little box. Couldn't do this five years ago. Uh, it's really incredible how loaded this little piece of equipment is. As a matter of fact, most of this little handheld is just battery. Take the battery off, and we certainly have a very small rig. Uh, I'd like to show you what an amateur radio station looks like, Mark. So let's take a look here at some uh, pictures that we brought along with us this evening and uh, get a chance to see a real amateur radio station. Uh, this particular one is located not too far from here. And uh, as you can see, it's got the microphones and all the equipment uh, all lined up, including a television set to watch your program. Uh, and it's uh, fully equipped with low band equipment. The equipment that you see in this picture uh, makes it possible to talk around the world. Let's take a look at the next one. And uh, we'll take another look at another view of a close-up of some of the equipment. On the left is an amplifier, and the centerpiece of the equipment that we're using is, um, is a, um, uh, the low-band transceiver. Let's take a closer look at that transceiver, and uh, we'll get another look at it here. A little uh, next slide here. Uh, hopefully it will come up real quick. There we go. That's, uh, that's an amateur radio low-band transceiver. It runs 100 watts of power. It transmits and receives and it will send a signal around the world without any problems. With all those dials in there, I mean, you got to really know a lot about which was which. I mean, yes, you do, and it all comes expert. with experience. Most amateurs could hop, operate that rig with about 10 minutes worth of training. If you're, if you're familiar with the equipment, uh, you're familiar with all the equipment. There's many mass manufacturers of amateur radio equipment, but this one is made by Kenwood and is made in Japan, is about, as is about 80% of the amateur equipment today made in Japan. Let's take a look at the next picture here, and uh, we get a shot of another part of this particular amateur station. Uh, this looks like a com simple computer setup, but indeed we, we communicate by computer on the air, send a signal out on the air with a small transceiver. Let's take a look at what the screen looks like in what we call packet radio. There's a standard packet station, uh, and obviously it's a little hard to read on your screen, but uh, that shows uh, several amateurs talking to each other via digital communications here in the Twin Cities. So, on we go to the next picture. And uh, this is what a standard amateur radio uh, uh, tower looks like. 
uh, with its antennas. Uh, the large, looking, looking like a television antenna, the big one on the bottom of the, of the series of antennas, is called a beam. And the beam sends a signal all over the world, anywhere from New York to Madagascar to, uh, to Hawaii. And the whole top portion with the antennas rotates. We point the antennas where we want to talk. Let's take a look at another picture here. And this is a picture of a little lesser antenna system uh, and also located right here in our area. And that particular antenna is similar to the first one, just not as powerful and certainly not as high in the air. With the antennas, do you need a special license to have an antenna so high in your yard? Or no, on your no, your no. Anybody can put an antenna up for anything. You need a building permit, of course, from the city. But you don't need any kind of license other than a building permit. You don't have to, can, can't go as high as you want it, no red lights, there's no restrictions? Well, certainly you wouldn't want to put a 2,000-foot stick in your backyard. <laughs> your neighbors might be a little unhappy with you, and so will passing airplanes. But up to 100 feet, generally nobody cares as long as you get a building permit. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to have a license to put up an antenna but you have to have a license to put a signal out on that antenna. You can listen, but you can't transmit without a, a, a federal communications license. Okay, let's move right along here and uh, show you an event that just happened here in the Twin Cities area on October 30th. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the activities that amateur operators uh, are involved with and some of the things you asked about, Mark. This was an activity put on by a club here in the Twin Cities called the Twin Cities FM Club. And uh, they, they sponsor a show called Hamfest Minnesota. Hamfest Minnesota was presented at the St. Paul Civic Center just a couple of weeks ago. And here we have a quick look at the outside of the St. Paul Civic Center. Now let's move inside and take a look at what happened that day. Some 4,000 amateur radio operators throughout the Midwest gathered for a very large show, the largest amateur radio show ever presented in the state of Minnesota. Uh, uh, we'll take a look here at another shot and uh, get a little, that one's a little tougher to see perhaps. Uh, we see some of the rows and rows of some of the booths and uh, equipment that's being shown for sale. We'll take a look here at another one and uh, we get a little bit brighter picture and we get a little bit of better feel of what was going on. Amateurs came to the show from Canada, uh, from Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, Michigan, North and South Dakota, throughout Minnesota, and as far away as Missouri and New York, believe it or not. Is this show just in Minnesota, or is it a national show? This is a regional local show, but it's starting to attract this national attention that even a major manufacturer, ICOM, was displaying their amateur radio equipment. ICOM is one of the uh, big national, international manufacturers of equipment, and they were there this year. Uh, we also had a lot of other people showing equipment, too. Here's a retailer uh, showing electronic amateur radio equipment for sale. We're actually standing inside the booth looking out at people examining the equipment. Amateur radio equipment can cost as little as $100 or as much as $5,000. You're limited by the size of your pocketbook and how fancy you want to be. Uh, there was uh, many uh, booths set up by some of the clubs in the Twin Cities. There's dozens and dozens of amateur radio clubs. Uh, this particular group is called Twins Land. They specialize in using amateur radio by digital packet, as we saw uh, just a little earlier here in the show, that television screen. Um, the, uh, another club, the Twin City FM Club, which is located in Golden Valley, actually headquartered at the Golden Valley Police and Safety Center, uh, has a large membership of the largest club in the Twin Cities and also the club that presented the show. Uh, we're looking at some of the flea market area, and like any flea market, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. Definition, in case you haven't heard of any flea market, is junk changing basements, <laughs> from basement to basement across town. And, uh, but we also find some nice equipment in our shows, in the flea market, and computer equipment too. And as a matter of fact, the show is called Hamfest Minnesota and Computer Expo. About a third to a half of it now is computer equipment. Uh, here's another uh, picture of a uh, of, of, uh, fellow selling some software. Uh, computer has become a very major part of all the ham radio shows because most ham radio operators own computers. Can you buy the equipment first and then take the boards or the, the license, or do you have to get your license first and then buy the equipment? First? You can own the equipment, you can't operate it. You can listen to it, but you can't transmit on it until you get the license. And most people get equipment first, beginning equipment, then they go get the license, then they operate it, and they're never happy and they want to get better equipment. And that's why shows like this give them a chance to buy and sell equipment among each other. Here we're seeing some of the seminars that were presented at Hamfest, Minnesota. Uh, there was uh, seminars on virtually every subject you want to know about amateur radio, and also exams were given for those people wanting to either get a license or upgrade their license. Another quick shot here of uh, a demonstration of a building of an amateur radio amplifier to increase your signal power. 
uh, and then uh, the VE exams, the uh, uh, VE is the volunteer examiners that uh, give tests uh, for the FCC. Uh, here's an overall shot of the show, and finally one more shot here, uh, and that is myself with my friend uh, Kenny Bell, KH6AFQ from Hilo, Hawaii, drawing the grand prizes at Hamfest, Minnesota this year. So that's what a show looks like, and that's one of the activities that uh, has become uh, a very big thing and an important thing to amateur operators. But you asked about activities, mm -hmm. didn't you? Yeah. So what does an amateur radio operator do besides talk to each other on silly little handheld, with little funny, we call them rubber ducks? Well, I'll tell you some of the things we do. Uh, Joe mentioned uh, Skywarn. Uh, when there is a threat of a tornado in, in and around the Twin Cities, in virtually any city in the country, but especially we're interested in here, amateur operators are dispatched out to site and look for tornadoes, cloud developments, uh, windstorm, hail, and report it to the Weather Service. We report into a central station through a repeater, just like we demonstrated talking to a repeater tonight. We report it in on a repeater, and the Weather Service takes that information and gets it on your TV set that says there has been a tornado touchdown sighted uh, south of whatever, or uh, 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 threatening storms are coming in from whatever. Those are professional or semi-professional uh, sighters reporting it in on amateur radio, and they're all licensed amateurs. And all these people have been Weather Bureau trained to the Skywarn system. And that's one of our very important functions. For example, the Twin Cities Marathon, believe it or not, most all the communications for the Twin City Marathon is carried on via amateur radio, the little pieces of equipment like that. Uh, the day of the Twin Cities Marathon this past October, there were over 100 ham radio operators out there providing communications on people dropping out of the race, the need for uh, medical assistance, uh, water, supplies like the Vaseline, they rub on their legs and all those things. Uh, amateur radio provided the communications so the Twin City Marathon could work at absolutely no cost. Because amateur radio is what it says. We're amateurs. We cannot be reimbursed for what we do. Some of the other activities that we participate in amateur radio include uh, rescue efforts. The Amateur Radio Mobile Corps, a division of the Hennepin County Sheriff, is amateur operated, uh, supported, however, by the Hennepin County Sheriff, provide communication services during floods, uh, tornado touchdowns, uh, uh, drownings, and we're very often called up to help and provide communication. Did you that. help a lot with the Iowa drone? Well, that's a good question. I spoke earlier about my friend Ed Addy, who uh, provided the uh, communications during the Gulf War. Well, Ed went down to uh, Des Moines, uh, and took several amateurs from the Twin Cities with him. Now, remember, they didn't have telephone services. Their telephone services were basically down during that flood. They didn't have uh, a lot of their communications equipment were flooded out. They didn't have any means of communications in and out of Des Moines. Amateur radio saved the day. Amateurs from throughout the Midwest converged on Des Moines area, providing communications with the outside world. And they were there for three or four weeks, Mark, providing that communications, not only with the outside world and, and, and information on how your sister was doing down in Des Moines, uh, but also uh, providing communications, dispatching uh, fire and dispatching trucks and, and construction people all over the city. Uh, and that's a good question, and that's where amateur radio really is in a payday providing communications in disaster situations. Uh, certainly, um, you remember the airplane that flew around the world? It was called the Flight of the Voyager. It flew around the world. Remember that funny double-barreled double plane? It was flew by yeah, a gentleman by the name of Dick Rutan. And when he flew that plane around the world a few years ago, uh, he flew using communications via ham radio. He was a licensed amateur operator, and all the communications with the flight of that plane was on amateur radio. I actually had a chance to listen to it myself and hear him talking back to the base in California. Yeah, one quick question. When you talk on the radio, you give your call letters, you know everybody by the, your friend as a call letter. Can't you just say your name, Mike Siegelman or John Smith? No, we usually all uh, refer to each other by our calls. I'm known as KZOB or D. They talk about BUD all the time. They seldom use my last name. Uh, the gentleman we talked to this evening is Joe Dolinsky, but I never use the name Joe uh, Dolinsky on there, just Joe. Uh, some of the most famous people in the world are amateur operators. Arthur Godfrey was an amateur, uh, may, uh, although quite ill now. Barry Goldwater is an amateur operator. Ronnie Millsap and, and uh, remember Jose Feliciano, Light My Fire, is an amateur operator. Uh, we're, we, you can find us at all ranks, and nobody ever uses their last name. And even these famous people go by their first name. How do you know their names if they're all on? Uh, is there anything they can't give out, like their phone numbers? Well, they can give out anything they want to. Mm -hmm. They give out everything they want to. But usually we just uh, we give out our call and our name, and if somebody wants to know more about us, fine. And we also give out telephone numbers on there if people ask for it. It's a great hobby. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's for everybody. 
My wife's an amateur radio operator. I, I know uh, senior citizens that are operators. And all walks of life, Dr. Lawyer Merchant Chief. What a great way to spend the rest of your life, communicating not only with people you see every day, but also on amateur radio. And there's a lot of people I've never even met that I've talked okay. to many times on ham radio. All right. Uh, I've got one more question. Is there yes. a number they can call you at? Absolutely. If you want more information on amateur radio, you can always give me a call, and I'll be happy to help in any way I can. My home telephone number in Minneapolis is 542-8450. You can ask for Mike, or you can ask for k 0 B U D. I always like to add this much for you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for coming. If you have any questions or comments about our program, please do give us a call at 533-1710. For we appreciate your comments about our show at 533-1710. Please don't delay. Next week, we'll have another exciting guest on And Now You Are Aware. This is your host, Mark Green, saying again, I'd like to thank Mike Siegelman, amateur radio operator. Thank you, Mike, for coming to our show. Pleasure. Thank you, Mike. And now, you are aware. <laughs>